Dear friends near and far, as I've told you a number of times before, I think, uh, this Trinity season when we hang our church in green paraments uh, sort of reminds us of the life and growth going on out there, let's say, in the plant world. And also through the word of Christ, it's to bring for us a time of growth uh, in the teachings of the faith. Anyway, uh, we come this Sunday uh, to a kind of a challenging epistle that isn't always very easy to understand. And some of the great teachers of the Bible even have shied away from it on occasion as a preaching text. And then, uh, to be honest, I look back in my own records and I can't even see a record that I ever preached on it. So I think it's right for us in the spirit of growth uh, to try to tackle some of these things. And we're glad to have you along uh, as we worship together through this video service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Now let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, it's by your gift alone that your faithful people render true and laudable service. So help us steadfastly to live in this life according to your promises and finally attain your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle for this now, which is the twelfth Sunday after Trinity, is recorded in the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians in the third chapter. And this uh, is the portion of scripture which we will use now as the basis for the preaching today. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, 
Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the seventh chapter. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, in the words of the Apostles' Creed, we confess our holy faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
May God give to one and all of you people much grace and peace in the knowledge of him and of his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. As I mentioned, we're going to focus now on the words of the epistle read earlier in this service from 2 Corinthians in the third chapter. And that reading begins at the first verse this way. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Now let's pray. Lord, set our feet on solid ground and let your words go with us in all our ways. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may your name, O Lord, be praised. Amen. In the holy name of Jesus, my dear treasured viewers and friends, this is one of those times when we got to go back to Sunday school for a minute so you can get a proper handle on the epistle reading for today. Some of you, I'm sure, remember the Bible story from Sunday school about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments up there on Mount Sinai. Others of you may recall it kind of vaguely, but have gone a little bit fuzzy about the details, and still others of you may draw a complete blank when I mention it. So I'm hoping that this little Sunday school detour might help. Remember again how God's glory came through Moses in those days. The Lord had saved his people, the children of Israel, from slavery in Egypt, and he rescued them in power by leading them across the parted waters of the Red Sea on dry ground. And then after that, he brought those waters back together uh, to thwart the Egyptian army when it came and tried to bring them back into slavery. And then the Israelites were out in the desert, and they wandered there for years on end. And at one point, they came to Mount Sinai, where the Lord would give them his holy law, the Ten Commandments. That event, dear friends, was filled with fear and awe. I'm going to just skim a little bit of how the Bible describes it. There was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud over the mountain, a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the Israelite camp trembled. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended in fire. The mountain itself trembled violently. And after God gave his law to Moses up there, Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. They were inscribed front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Well, anyway, when Moses got toward the bottom of that mountain, he was horrified because he found in the meantime, while he was up there, God's people had started dabbling in idol worship and in all kinds of lewd conduct. So Moses actually threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them to pieces. The Lord later told Moses to come up again. And once more, God wrote down his law. It was to be declared to the people with the grave warning that they would be destroyed if they broke it. And then the strangest thing happened. The Bible says when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets in his hand, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. This was the reflection of God's glorious presence in Moses' face just the reflection, so I'm not talking about the glory itself, but just the reflection was so intense that people were afraid to come near him. And later on, Moses got into the habit of draping a kind of a fail, a fail rather, over his face after he would speak with God so that the people would not be overwhelmed. And gradually, in each one of those episodes, the radiance would fade. There was glory awe and wonder when the law was delivered. Even when you read about it in the Bible, even if you have the details fresh in your head again, you and I still cannot fully imagine it. I mean, we may have had passing puny little experiences with this kind of thing. Let's say if some really heavy object would fall, you know, and smack the cement floor right next to where you're standing and scare you silly. Or I remember long, long ago, sitting in my office in London, Ontario, when all of a sudden I felt our church building shake because it turned out there was a slight earthquake of all places underneath Lake Erie between us and the American city of Cleveland, Ohio. 
Or when you've poured too much lighter fluid on the charcoal in the grill behind your house and a lighted match makes the flame sort of flare right up in your face. None of those things compared to the glory and awe that people felt when God's law came down. Nobody had to stage a little bit of fake drama or provide what they nowadays call special effects. And yet, as holy and awesome as it was when God's law was pronounced, its threats and its promises could not bring you a hair's breadth closer to God because the fact is that the law does the opposite. It kills. Moses' task was to tell humankind God demands holiness from you. Violate that and your sin will lead to death. And not just death in the body, but final separation from God himself. No wonder people trembled when all that stuff happened up there in Mount Sinai. They knew that they were not what God was demanding from them. Now let's shift gears and come back from our little Sunday school detour and return to today's epistle. The Apostle Paul here is comparing God's law which Moses received and delivered to people. He's comparing it to the Holy Christian Gospel, the message of the saving acts of Jesus the Christ. At first blush, I might as well admit this straight up, the messengers of Jesus don't always come in with a bang the way that Moses did. I told you that when Moses was going up to receive that law, there was thunder and lightning and fire and smoke and earthquakes and trumpets. You know how it went when the Apostle Paul preached the Christian message for the first time ever on the continent of Europe? There was just a tiny little group of women huddled outside beside a river near the city of Philippi. No thunder, no lightning, no fire and smoke, no Mormon tabernacle choir, no thrilling music or crowds of clapping worshipers. Or another time, do you know how it went when that St. Paul preached Jesus' resurrection in the great city of Athens? Some of them sneered, the Bible says. A few men believed. Not all that much to see. And while we're on the subject of Jesus' messengers, we might as well admit our own pastors can't match the glory that accompanied Moses there on the mountain. We, fact is, are often very faltering speakers. We're weak and sinful human beings, and we know what we are inside. We often feel inside how King David felt when he said, my sin is always before me. We can't always thrill you, and we can't always make you tremble. But today's epistle calls Moses' work the ministry that brought death. And then it calls the gospel of Jesus the ministry of the Spirit and the ministry that brings righteousness. Do you know why that is? It's because the Christian gospel is the word from Jesus. It's the word about Jesus. It's the word that tells you that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you grasp what that means? It means that Jesus never came into the world just to be one more religious guru telling you, well, do this, do that, and you'll live. On the other hand, break this and violate that, and you're going to be destroyed. Jesus did not just come to threaten and to promise. Jesus actually came to trade places with you. He loaded your wrongs onto his back. He carried your wrongs up to his cross. He let the punishments that were destined for you fall on him instead. And then, here's that trading places business, Jesus covered you with his righteousness so that God now counts you as spotless and clean and holy in his sight. That's why the Bible calls the gospel the ministry that brings righteousness. Because Jesus' saving actions have brought God's righteousness to you as an undeserved gift. And the Bible also here in this epistle calls Christ's gospel the ministry of the Spirit because God's Spirit is in this message of Christ's forgiveness. You see, the Spirit works through that message, not just to rehearse for you a few historical facts that you can file away, you know, in your mind and memory, 
but to actually kindle inside of you the faith to believe it. I want you to picture yourself now sitting in a hospital, right outside the operating room, where the dearest loved one in your life, whom you just couldn't bear to lose, is undergoing life and death surgery. Imagine how fretful you would be if that operation dragged on for hours more than they originally predicted. And now picture the chief surgeon coming out of the operating room. And when you ask, doctor, how did it go? The surgeon grins from ear to ear and tells you it was a wonderful success. She's going to be just fine. I guarantee you, you would never take that as just a piece of information. It's breathtaking good news. It's the kind of word that would give your heart the courage to believe what you had been longing to hear all afternoon as you sat there. See, Moses' message about God's law, his Ten Commandments, couldn't do that. They just demanded, do this and you'll live. Disobey and you're going to get hammered. The gospel of Jesus Christ, by contrast, brings you help that's already been bought and paid for. It demands nothing of you. It brings God's righteousness to where you are as a gift. And this gospel, this ministry of the Spirit, can lay hold of your heart. It can give you the faith to believe everything that it describes, that Jesus Christ's rescue is all for you. That's how Christ's gospel can set the stage for confidence and hope. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God, wrote St. Paul. Not that we're competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, you know, like those letters, you know, that God carved into stone of the Ten Commandments, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So you see, the glory of Christ's gospel is not built on us weak and imperfect messengers. It's not built on whether we can make it thunder and lightning and provide smoke and drama and put on a really good show that gives everybody present goosebumps. This glory runs deeper even than all the gripping things that people saw coming out off Mount Sinai in Moses' time because the glory springs up from God's undeserved gift to you. And this gospel ministry outshines even the dramatic stuff that came through Moses' message. It's like Paul says here, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, and in a way Moses' ministry did seem glorious, it was pretty impressive, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious at that time, in Moses' time, has no glory now, it says here, in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, see, remember that glow in Moses' face that faded, then how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? And it does last. The glories that are brought on by Christ's gospel will never, ever end. In the last book of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 7, you have that glorious picture of redeemed people in heaven shouting and worshiping in their white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And the words of that Revelation chapter 7 tell you just how they got there. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's Jesus. And this is why it says there before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The glory of the gospel of Christ, which brought his righteousness to those people, which brought the Spirit to those people, and gave them the courage to believe, that glory never fades. And that's what filled apostles like Paul with confidence that they weren't wasting their time. Even if they didn't always bring lightning and thunder and convert huge crowds by the millions on the spot. And it's what can create hope inside of you that doesn't have to die. Even if your life as a believer doesn't always, you know, convince other people. And even if sometimes it doesn't look like all that much to you. Jesus Christ has brought to you, my dear friend, 
what Moses never could. And it is a great kindness that God sets these words before us to make that so very clear once again today. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray now for the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people in keeping with their need. That men, women, and children who never received the word of Christ might hear its glorious message. And that the spirit of Christ in our needy time may open their ears and implant lasting faith within them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That God may draw to himself all who have once confessed the faith but in busyness or neglect have drifted away from hearing the word Christ speaks. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That Christ by his word may come close into the face of each one of us. That we draw near to him with honest repentance and in sincere faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That the Lord would make an end to the sorrows of our mission partners in Ukraine suffering from ongoing war. That he might stop the destruction of homes and cities along with the injury and the killing of innocent people and grant in Eastern Europe the needed gift of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That the God and ruler of nations would guide our King, the Prime Minister and Parliament of Canada, the Premier and Legislature of Ontario, and the leaders of our local communities to make proper decisions for our life together, and would turn away from the temptation to care mostly about political gain for themselves. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That we time and again heed Christ's invitation to pray to the Lord of the harvest, to provide workers as pastors, teachers, and missionaries, and that God would see the need of our churches and of humankind everywhere, and raise up messengers of the gospel to call people to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Accept these prayers, dear God of love, as our spiritual sacrifice. We offer them in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.